Hey, good evening. Um, tonight's program, as we've been talking about, is on glider operations in World War II. And, and I'll introduce our speaker, Jerry Devlin, in a little while. He's going to talk for about 45 minutes, giving an overview on, on airborne operations. And then we'll have three veterans come up. Uh, Robert Carr, who was a C-47 pilot, towed gliders uh, not into Normandy. He dropped paratroopers into Normandy, but he towed gliders into southern France, into Holland, and then across the Rhine. And then we've got Robert Ehrenberg, who was a, uh, a glider pilot in the Pacific, and Ray Nagel, who served with the 321st Glider Field Artillery and uh, made a glider assault into Holland. Our speaker is Jerry Devlin. And I first heard of him in 1979 when his first book, Paratrooper, was published. And it became very quickly the Bible for airborne operations in World War II. And since 1979, I don't think anything surpassed it. I think it remains the Bible of World War II airborne operations. There's other books that deal with parts of it, but I don't think there's another book that comes close as far as giving an overall overview of all the airborne operations in World War II. He also wrote the book on the topic tonight, Silent Wings, and a book on the 503rd Parachute Infantry's jump into Corregidor in the Philippines. He's published numerous articles uh, for magazines, encyclopedias, newspapers, and periodicals. His most recent work was on the history of the Purple Heart. He's currently working on a book on General Gavin, who commanded the 82nd Airborne Division in World War II. He had a 20-year Army career, retiring as a major. He went to the Benning School for Boys at uh, Infantry Officer Candidate School. I had to say it. OK. <laughs> and this was after completing, I, there's the confusion, seven or eight years as an enlisted man. Eight. eight years as an enlisted man, started out as a sergeant first class, and then was demoted to second lieutenant. <clears throat> I've been a second lieutenant, I know. Uh, he served in the Korean War and the Vietnam War, two, tour two tours in Vietnam. He's a graduate of the Command General Staff College. He's a holder of the Distinguished Service Cross, one step below the Medal of Honor. He has five bronze stars, a Purple Heart, Combat Infantryman's Badge with a star, a Senior Parachutist Badge, a Ranger Tab, which means he's Ranger Qualified, and in 1994, he was inducted into the U.S. Army Ranger Hall of Fame. So I'd like to introduce Jerry Devlin. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Like I say, my name is Jerry Devlin. I'm delighted to be with you here tonight. I've uh, never been to Minnesota before, but if it helps, I was a big fan of the Mary Tyler Moore show. Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know, I forget that, uh, thanks to my buddy Hal Rhodes sitting here, that. Uh, that show was based here in, in the city. So thank you for that tour again today. Uh, before going any further, I must thank uh, uh, Colonel Patton, uh, his good right-hand man, Doug Becky, and all members of the World War II History Roundtable for the great job they've been doing. I'm sure you know this already, but uh, this outfit is known throughout the whole United States and in Europe, too. So uh, it's, it's a very, very well-known group, and I'm proud to be a part of it tonight. Um, I have very strict orders to give you a quick 45-minute blast from the past. Uh, my talk's going to be on the World War II combat gliders and the uh, daring souls that flew those things. It, uh, I'm going to start off by giving you a little song and dance. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, because a good many of you are, probably know more about the glider program than I do. But I'll give you a quick blast from the past as to how we got in the business the United States got in the world of uh, flying combat gliders. And after that, I'm going to have a little series of slides that I've zeroed in over here. And um, as you probably all know, you know what the definition of an expert is? It's a guy from out of town with slides. So uh, <laughs> I want you to know without any doubt I'm an expert. But uh, anyway, that's what I'm going to do. I used to be an instructor in many Army schools. And uh, we were told to tell your group what you're going to be talking about and then tell them what you're going to tell them, and then shut up and sit down. So I'll try to be very brief. But um, first of all, the history of American gliders, the roots go back very far into the 30s when the Americans had very few, well, had zero gliders, actually combat gliders. But the uh, American uh, citizens who were fairly well-to-do and had the money to do so, a great many of them invested in what we know today as sailplanes, you know, real gliders. And um, 
they were quite a very elite group, and not everybody could afford to buy, probably to buy their own. So um, when World War II began, we, the Americans, had very few people who were qualified or even had ridden in a glider because, for a number of reasons. One is they didn't have the bucks to, uh, to buy their own glider. And number two, if you were in the United States Armed Services uh, during the 30s, a, a regulation was passed that said you could not at any time take part in any uh, off-duty hours uh, riding in gliders because they were considered to be just too dangerous, which they were. People were frequently killing themselves in those things. But um, meanwhile, when the Americans are under restrictions about not being able to fly in gliders, uh, in faraway Russia and in Germany, uh, there were many active uh, soaring associations where you know, glider flying was a must because, as you know, at the end of World War I, uh, Germany was forbidden to have uh, powered aircraft. Uh, and it took until about the 1930s when the Soviets uh, had ex begun to express uh, a great interest in not only in gliders but in parachute units. They had uh, jump schools scattered throughout the Soviet Union. And they also were experimenting not with just gliders that peacefully you know, flew along up in the air and then, then landed, but they were experimenting with uh, combat assault gliders, meaning you know, in, a, in a real glider there would perhaps be one passenger, I mean the, the pilot, and perhaps a passenger. Uh, whereas combat gliders are usually a pilot or perhaps two pilots with about eight or ten men in the back carrying uh, the, the rear end of the aircraft. Uh, armed with automatic weapons or bringing in light vehicles to uh, participate in ground landing missions. The Soviets rightly saw, as did uh, Germany back in the mid-30s, that uh, when they were experimenting with paratroopers, that simply by nature of their mission, the paratroopers jumped into combat armed only with, well, they all carried a pistol, first of all, and they carried a weapon of some sort, usually a rifle. But once they hit the ground, the paratroopers were pretty much on their own. They had no heavy weapons with which to destroy or knock out tanks. There were almost always tanks were known to be sent in and knock out the paratroopers because the, the paratroopers simply didn't have, didn't have any weapons that were strong enough to knock out a tank or an armored vehicle for that matter. So there was considerable experimentation uh, done by the, uh, by the uh, Soviets. And by 1935, they had uh, developed uh, they, the Soviets, had developed an enormous school in Russia and in Belarus, Belarus if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, they put on, in, in the summer of 1935, an enormous demonstration or example of uh, Russian air power, including the parachute troops, and followed up by glider landings. They invited all the military attaches stationed in the Soviet <coughs> Union at that time, which included, of course, every civilized nation had military attaches there. And they attended it and were positively astounded that the, uh, the Soviets dropped close to a regiment of parachute troops. And they followed it up with, I think it was something like 132 combat assault gliders from which uh, small, weren't very large vehicles, but armored cars, that sort, of st that sort of stuff. A very impressive display. So the Germans returned to Germany, the Americans came back to America, the Americans did nothing because they said, you know, gliders, paratroopers, that's kind of silly stuff. We can't do that. And as you remember, I probably don't remember, but in the 30s, the United States was an isolationist kind of organization that didn't want anything to do with uh, wars. And I'll, I'll second that. But uh, didn't want anything to do with wars. And we just t broke ourselves away from all forms of uh, aggressive actions. Uh, the army, our American army was downsized to about 30,000 people. However, in uh, in Germany and in Russia, they said, gee, this is, that was quite a display we saw there. So the Germans began aggressively uh, forming some very large, expressive, expensive gliders that could carry not only uh, light ammunition, but they finally developed some that actually could car carry a light tank, if you can imagine that. So uh, tremendous developments. Uh, the Soviets, meanwhile, continued their experimentation with, with tanks and with paratroopers. And by the, going back to the Germans, in the summer of 1940, when Germany invaded the lowlands, they started off their invasion by, you probably heard this story before, but very quickly, the Soviets started their invasion by making a glider assault landing on a fort in Belgium called Ibn Imayel, very, very small fort that was 
st uh, located right on the main thrust where the German army was going to break across through Belgium into Holland and down into France. So that assault force, that German assault force consisted of something like 21, I forget the number, 21, 22, 23 combat assault gliders. They jumped on the fort, or rather they landed on the fort by glider, and uh, in about 30 minutes they had captured this fort, which is a, a tremendous feat of arms, just a tremendous feat of arms. So when that happened in the summer of 1940, the Americans began looking at it. We still were not at war. Pearl Harbor was still a year and a half away, and the Americans said, boy, that's pretty scary stuff. And so the Americans began conducting light, exper uh, light experiments. So, but it, it wasn't until after World War II was declared in the United States that we, we the Americans, began a, um, a, a, a glider paratrooper program of, as they say, of, of epic proportions. It was a, uh, a whole new type of warfare. We, we fielded parachute units. We fielded glider units. American production went in, Eurosia the Riveter and all that sort of stuff we've all heard about went into action. Uh, American engineering, American get up and do it kind of thing. And in, in a period of three years, the Americans had five parachute divisions and some 6,000 glider pilots. And as the saying goes, the guys who flew those gliders are pretty tough characters. They marched to a different tune. They were a little bit older than the average soldier. Many of them uh, had flown sailplanes as used during the 30s. And, um, but they just had a certain thing about them. And the story goes, and I think this is true, I'm setting you up for a joke here, but uh, so the saying goes, you could always tell a glider pilot, you know, by they had some kind of unusual habits. Drinking habits is what I'm talking about. And uh, so the story goes that at, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, during the uh, 1943, that uh, there, on that base there are a number of marine units a number of paratrooper units, and a great many glider pilots. And so booze was running out at the officers club and other places, and so some of the local guys started developing their own very strong booze, and they tried to sell it off at the officers club. And what would happen is, sometimes there'd be some Marines in there, you know, pretty tough guys, there'd be paratroopers in the club, and a Marine would step up and say, give me a shot of that stuff that you give, you've build, you've been making out there in the boondocks. And a Marine would take it, and drink it down and say, oh my God, that stuff is strong, it's terrible, get it, you should be arrested for something, get it away from me. And of course the paratrooper would come up and say, that, that wimpy marine, could, give me a shot of that. So they'd take a shot and they'd say, holy, that stuff is terrible. And, uh, but then a glider pilot would step up and say, give me a shot of that stuff. So they give him the same, out of the same jug, they give it to him, they'd drink it down and say, oh, oh, that's terrible, terrible. Give me another shot of that, will you? <laughs> so they're real characters. I'm told that story is true. But um, anyway, so that's my song and dance, pretty much in how we start. We, the Americans, started uh, putting ads in the newspapers, trying to entice young men to volunteer for uh, for glider training. And up pretty soon, by 1942, the glider pilot training was up and running. But it took till about 1943 to have a a, a good, strong force developed. Uh, as I say, there were about some 6,000 of them that were trained, the glider pilots. And they were, in the history of warfare, they're probably the most unusual bunch of, uh, with, I'm not setting you up for another joke, but they're probably the most unusual type of warriors that we ever had because not only were the glider pilots, this was true only in, well, in the American and the British Army. We, the Americans, trained the glider pilots, of course, to fly combat assault gliders. And their job was to, of course, carry, you know, fly gliders that had upwards of 15 to 30 men in them, and to fly them in to support the paratroopers and bring in heavy guns, tanks, that's what, I mean, yeah, light tanks, anti-tank weapons. And um, so there was just a very tough job trying to get these guys to do that, up, get it up and running. But not only were they taught to fly gliders into combat, but they were, these guys had to fly into air, airfields they never landed in before. And they had to do it at night. You know, I've been on airplanes many a time flying along and I say, I can't imagine someone getting into an aircraft, meaning a glider pilot to get into an aircraft and take it behind enemy lines where they had never been there before. And they can only hope that the airplane can bring them to the correct spot to set them down. And often that didn't happen. 
But not only did they do that, but they had to do it at night. And that's very difficult. It's sort of like when I was in the paratroopers, we, all, we didn't mind jumping during daylight because you could already you could see the ground and know what you're doing. But quite honestly, jumping at night used to scare me because you said, I, we don't know if the other airplanes in the air are going to run into us. Where are we coming down? And, it was just was kind of scary, but that compares, doesn't even compare in the slightest to flying a glider filled with ammunition into a field that you never saw before and where you might not get there all the way. And the, the problem was if the tow plane got them to the right spot and down they went and it, they were coming into a field and they didn't see in the aerial photographs that they looked at before the mission that there were trees at the other end, they couldn't step on the gas and fly. It'll fly over them and go. There was, they couldn't do that. They just had to take it, take it where they landed. It was very, very difficult. So that's the story of the glider pilots. I'm going to shut up there, and I'm going to phase two of my expert show, and I'm going to show you some slides and tell you a little bit the gliders they flew. Okay? Here we go. Thank you. Back in the 1930s, the uh, the only real interest that the Americans had in gliders was in the, or the United States Navy. Uh, while I was writing that book, uh, Silent Wings, I interviewed a fellow who was a Navy captain, his last name was Barnaby, who as a young man, and this, this guy was an old time, but as a young man, he was a, a gopher for, the, for Orville and Wilbur Wright, if you can imagine. That's, how old, that's how old this guy was. But uh, he enjoyed glider flying, he joined the United States Navy, and he applied for a flight training. And while I was talking to him, I said, well, what was that flight training like? He said, it was very interesting. But what the Navy did, he said, it was the only branch of the service who did that. They, before we got into the power aircraft, they used to teach us how to fly gliders, sailplanes. And he said that um, the advantage of that was uh, that it gave you more of a feeling of you're one with your aircraft. And you can tell whether you can feel the aircraft and you sort of bond with it and know that what the right thing to do is when the air was moving your way. And so he wound up uh, trying to get the US Army to chime in and for the Army pilots to take it. But the Army said, no, we don't have the foolishness with the gliders. So Captain Barnaby w was pressed by his superiors. He said, well, what can we do? We've got sailplanes. What can we do with them except teach you pilots how to fly them? So at that time, uh, blimps were very big in those days. And so he said, what they did is they said to him, well, how do you think we could use gliders in, in, in association with the blimps? And now, as you probably know, when a blimp is coming into land, or an airship, when they're coming into land, if one of the first things they do is they, they, can you hear me okay? One of the first things they do is they drop lines so that the air crew, you ever watch, the, we've all watched that horrible thing where the, uh, the Zeppelin was coming into uh, New Jersey, you remember when the thing caught fire? What was the name of that airship? Yeah, the Hindenburg. If you watch that film closely next time you see it, you can see all the American sailors and Marines on the ground. They've, the Hindenburg had already dropped its lines, and so their job was to pull it down and tie it to the ground, and then they would have these big cranes that come out on both ends of the airship and, and lock it down. So Captain Barnaby says, you know, what we could do is we could put a glider on an airship, and as we're coming into uh, an airport, what they used to have to do is parachute a man down to the ground and uh, try to get word to the commanding officer, the base, we're coming in, get the guys out there to get the ropes. So he says, why don't we put a glider on the bottom of an airship, and when they're a couple of miles out, we can drop the glider and sail it into the air base and say, the airship's coming in for a landing, get the guys out there. So I said to Captain Barnum, he says, I said, how the heck did you do that? I gotta watch my time here. I said, how the heck did you do He says, well, I said, how did you get from the airship down to the glider? He says, well, they had an aluminum ladder. That's, that, that they were, it's like a fireman. They stick the, they pull the ladder out of the belly of the, of the airship down to the, the, the seat of the glider. And he says, I just sort of go down there and sit in there. They, okay, take the ladder back up. And they cut it loose and down they go. And I says, my God, man, how did you do that? He says, it was easy. It was easy. But I just can't imagine doing anything like that. So that's what we had to begin with. That was one of the roles. As it turned out, uh, it was very successful for the Navy. And I wanted to say real quick before I forget it, um, in, in the 19, um, 
I think it was in the 70s, the Air Force Academy uh, began also teaching their, uh, the, their students who were going to be going to flight school to fly gliders as well. And one of those, you know, the benefits of the learning how to fly a glider before learning how to fly a power aircraft, you became one with the aircraft, and you know the wind was going, and it was a very good training to have. Now, if you remember this heroic civilian air captain, I don't know what his name is, I've already forgotten how soon they forget, you know, they landed that aircraft on, was it on the Hudson River in New York? He was, a, he was a glider pilot at the Air Force Academy. You probably heard that, haven't you? Well, he was. And I like to think it because of his, you know, his, his ship stopped running, his aircraft stopped running, uh, the motor stopped running, he's got to get that big mother down. And thanks to his training on being able to uh, feel the aircraft and be one with his aircraft, he set that thing down and zero loss of life. Astounding. All right, enough for that. Here's one of the first gliders the Americans uh, designed. That was a, a CG-3A. It was a very light aircraft that could carry, I think it was eight men. And the obvious disadvantage of that aircraft, that glider, was it had a lot of broken ankles, those guys getting out of the glider. <laughs> Can you imagine leaping out of that thing? It was very tough on the ankles, I'm sure. So that was a very experimental. This is obviously a publicity shot. So that lasted about six months. They get rid of that. And then um, they came along with this thing. It's called the CG4A. Now, those of you that are even the slightest bit familiar with the glider program, this, this was the primary workhouse of the United States Armed Forces during World War II. It carried two pilots and 13 men. Or it could still carry two pilots when the assortment of uh, machinery to go in there. They could carry a jeep, they could carry artillery pieces, ammunition, medical supplies. The nose lifted up, I'll show you another better picture here. This is kind of a Hollywood thing, but it's very, <laughs> this is the way it happened. See the nose lifted up and there's some guys coming on the, on the hood of the glider, out of the jeep and obviously opposed publicity thing, but that's the way it operated. And um, many a glider story can tell you, the, many, many a glider pilot can tell you these tragic stories about when they, they land a glider, or coming in for a landing with a glider, and the jeep's right behind them and they would say to themselves, Mother of God, I hope I don't hit a tree or something because that jeep's got to go. And it's going to roll right over the top of them. But uh, very risky business. They're very courageous guys that did that kind of stuff. More like crazy, but... Okay, this is a publicity shot, too. This is how World War II... Again, it's a publicity stage shot, but this is the way it's supposed to work. The paratroopers that you see running toward the camera here their job was to jump in first, seize the airhead, you know, secure the airhead. And um, when they did, then in would come a C-47. And notice this one is pulling two gliders, two. They were capable of doing that. But uh, at any rate, the paratroopers seized the ground. And I'm sure someone said, lights, action. And they started running. And right on cue would come the gliders. And they'd, they'd drop. And they'd bring in the heavy artillery. Well, not heavy, but light artillery. They'd bring in jeeps, more ammunition, medics, first aid, that kind of stuff. So that's the way it worked. Okay. As the war went on, the Americans started building, along with many other countries, started building bigger and larger gliders. This is a CG-13A, I think it is. But it held, they have that man standing there to show you just how big it is. But that held 30 soldiers, a whole platoon or could carry a jeep and a light cannon. Remarkable, uh, remarkable aircraft. That was used only during, during one combat operation during World War II, and that was in the Philippines. But, uh, a huge aircraft, just huge. All right, the next one. This is, a, it's called a YCG-10. And as you can see, it's a little bit bigger. Let's see how many troops did it hold. It holds 40 troops as well. And it holds a combination of, that's a 105 howitzer. In addition to that, they could also bring on a, 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 light, a light, like usually a, a jeep, to tow that howitzer. Because again, the paratroopers, when we jumped, we had very light weapons. The, the strongest thing we had uh, during my time in the Air Force Service was a bazooka. 
which is everybody knows is no good against no good against a tank. The lady come out in the in the uh, mid 50s with uh, recoilless weapons. Uh, it's a very strong 57 millimeter recoilless weapon. It was like a big long thing like this. And um, am I doing something wrong? With you? Okay. But we were trained to use that puppy to, to uh, knock out tanks with. And it was a really remarkable weapon. It could kill a tank. I can tell you that. But that's uh, the end of that one. Here's another one. This is a YCG-16. It's got kind of a, it's a tragic yet a little bit humorous kind of thing. But this was designed to carry uh, 40 troops as well, or it could carry an artillery piece. You can see it's got two, uh, two sides of it. There's a, there's a wooden wall separating the two. And this was designed for the purpose of carrying, um, as I say, an artillery piece on one side, a prime mover forward, meaning a jeep on the other, and of course some of the troops to, to, carry, to execute the weapon. Um, but the sad thing is, this was uh, designed by a company out in California, as I remember, and for a uh, experimental test, they invited a bunch of brass out from Washington to observe this thing in flight. One of them was the, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the family, that the, the DuPont family. We have DuPont, big company for back to civil, or back to uh, back to Revolutionary War days. They provided gunpowder for the American Army. But um, Richard DuPont was one of those very well-to-do young men during the uh, 30s, who was a uh, uh, a champion sailplane glider. So these guys would get in a glider in Pennsylvania, they'd launch in the sky, and they'd fly down to, Wa believe it or not, they could fly down to Washington uh, by, by just following the thermals and amazing stuff. So Richard DuPont was the number two guy in the whole American production program for World War II gliders. And they invited him out to, pretty sure it was California, to observe this thing in action. So all these guys here are employees of the company that built it. They're not really soldiers, but nevertheless, uh, it sort of gives a good impression of what the thing was like. Uh, Richard DuPont got in the thing, it, it, uh, and they had a total of eight, um, eight passengers in it, and to give it a little bit of balance and to pretend or make believe that it had a heavy weapon in there in the Jeep, they put like, I forget how many sandbags filled with sand, they put it in the aft end of the aircraft. And as they were flying along, um, tragically, the it began what they call porpoising. You know, the, the ship pulling it. It was a B-17 pulling it, by the way. You can't get Just a terrible thing. But anyway, that's what they felt was needed to pull that big and heavy glider. They were going along, and it started porpoising. And what happened was the sandbags they had placed in the rear of the aircraft, you know, gravity was taking effect, and it was going up and down. And like flipping an egg, doing one of the ups and down movements as they were flying through the air, all the sandbags in the aft end of the aircraft started flipping forward, just like eggs. You know, someone's flying some eggs and flipping them to the other side of the frying pan. And pretty soon, all the weight was in the front of the aircraft, and it broke loose from the uh, B-17. And the only thing to do was, and by the way, it had, I should have said, it had two pilots in that. They sat, in, they sat behind one another, you know, one pilot, the other guy's there. So when that happened, the command pilot said, Everybody bail out, get out. This thing's going to come apart in moments. So everybody started jumping out of it, uh, including uh, Richard uh, DuPont. And long story short, um, got about another five minutes, so just bear with me. Uh, he jumped out, and unfortunately, he and, and uh, all but two of the other guys uh, died in a crash. Two of the jumpers uh, survived when they hit the ground. And many years later, when I was writing this book, uh, Silent Wings, I said, I got the name of the fellow who was the, uh, look at his name down here. What was his name? A fellow named Harry Pearl was one of the test engineers for that thing. And I said to myself, uh, I, found it, I found out where he was living and I called him and I said, imagine after that harrowing experience he had, you know, he, he didn't want to be anywhere near a glider anymore after jumping out and saving his life. So I called his house, he wasn't there, and his wife picked up, he said, hello. And I said, ma'am, I'm Jerry Delvin, I'm a writer, do you want a story about uh, the 
YCGD10 that your husband had a part in. I says, is he there, please, and could I talk to him? He says, no, he's all fine, there's glider today. He can call him tonight, though. <laughs> and I says, you yeah, go figure. But Harry lived to a, a ripe old age and died a peaceful death here about three months ago. Okay, those are the gliders, and the Americans were the only ones who do this during World War II. They said, uh, you know, once you put a glider down on the ground, how do you, how do you retrieve it? Like they fly them out of England, cross the English Channel, go down in anywhere from Holland to Normandy to southern France uh, in Italy. And they say, how do we, we just can't throw away this glider. It costs, each one of them cost around, give a tech a few thousand, $20,000, which was a lot of money back in those days. As far as I am, it's still a lot of money. But uh, so someone said, we just can't be making these things and throwing them away. So uh, the Americans came up with a method for retrieving those gliders, picking them back up and flying them back to the air base. And hit, don't laugh, this is, this really is the way they did it. They would, um, they put up, you see the glider in the background there on the ground? And you see those two sticks sticking up there? Well, the, what they would do is there was a rope going back to the nose of the glider where, where the two pilots are in there to fly it back to the airport. And they would take that rope on the ground, a nylon rope. The nylon, as, nylon, as you know, stretches one third of its, of its uh, distance. It's a real pliable kind of a product. Uh, invented by DuPont, by the way. So what they would do is they'd take this rope, put it up to the top there, and run the tail end of it back to the glider. And then if you can imagine this, I just can't imagine doing this, but here's what they did. A C-47, when they gave him the word, would come down right on the deck. You see it there? And he had a hook on it. And he'd hook onto that, you know, that, those two sticks there, and they would catch the rope, and they'd go like heck, and off they would go, and they'd fly it back to the airport. And I said to many of the glider pilots, I says, wouldn't that must have been kind of a shock? You said, okay, here he comes, here he comes, and, and back you go. But he said, no, it's no more than as if you were on a trolley car, and it started going forward, you know, because of the elasticity of the nylon rope. And um, other glider pilots told me, no, it was really brisk, you'd have your hat in your head, and as soon as they took off, you happened to be in the back of the aircraft. <laughs> But such as, you know, going from zero to like uh, zero miles an hour to, I don't know, 120 miles an hour at one time. But, but that's the way they did it. And so the Americans saved a lot of us taxpayers money by inventing this way to recycle, or today they would call it recycling, I guess, those combat gliders. Well, I think that pretty much winds up my talk. Put the light on here. Um, I think I've got two more minutes to spare, but... Um, I hope that gave you a quick overview of what, the, what these guys did, these crazy glider pilots. And I should say, in addition to um, the glider pilots themselves who did this day after day, month after month, the U.S. Army had to convince a lot of young men to volunteer for duty in the glider troops. And these are guys who, as, as crazy it might seem, in, in those days the Army said, you, you, and you, you're going to be in the tanks. Get over there with that sergeant. He's going to teach you all about the tank. You, you, and you are going to be in the uh, truck driver's pool. So you're going to be truck drivers. And as simple as that, they said, and your next five guys, you're going to be in the glider. Get over here. They're going to take you down to Marin, Lorenberg, Max, in, in uh, North Carolina. And they're going to ride in the gliders. They had no say so. And the, the, the terrible part of it is, while the paratroopers, who are also the part of that team, you know, the parachute glider team, the paratroopers got 50 bucks a month as his duty pay. And they only jumped like maybe once or twice a month, sometimes more than that, but once or twice a month. And uh, they got the, the, the uh, pay for it, and they also got a special slick looking parachute badge. It was a real, you know, me strong guy, <laughs> a very, very proud of the wings. But the, the poor guys who wound up in the gliders. They, had no, they were given no badge to begin with. They, they finally were in 1944. The Army finally said, let's give these poor slobs a badge at least. <laughs> and, uh, and then they finally started, uh, started giving them uh, hats of this duty pay. It wasn't 50 bucks a month like the paratroopers got. It was roughly half, half of what their enlisted pay were. Sometimes it was like maybe 20, 30 bucks a month for 
having the privilege of riding in gliders. But, so a great many paratroopers, all of us including me, pretty egotistical guys, I think a pretty tough guy, you jump out of an airplane and ooh. But um, the, the gliders, the, the glide guys got overlooked a great deal. And the awful truth of the matter is a lot of guys, including me, because when I went there and went to parachute school, uh, they had just stopped. See, parachute school used to be four weeks long when I went in the Army. It was three weeks of parachute school and one week of uh, glider training. And that glider training consisted of nothing more of getting in a glider, then tour you around Fort Benning, and you land on a cement runway, and that was about the size of it. But uh, just before I went down to go to that parachute school, I was told all sorts of horror stories about the other guys who had been to jump school before me. You know, guys like to do that. Oh, you think it's tough here, man. Where did you get down to Benning? It's going to rip. But, uh, but all the paratroopers would say, but the really scary part is you got to ride in those gliders, man. I said, what's a glider? And they told me, I said, you have to do that? He said, yeah, that's part of the course. But fortunately, about a month before I went down to Benning, they discontin for, for, for financial reasons, they discontinued the gliders. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, I'm glad I didn't have to do that. So. Well, that concludes my talk. I'm going to be here all day tomorrow and uh, the rest of this evening. And if I can give you any more pearls of wisdom, I'll be happy to do that. And I thank you for your attention. Uh, this is Ray Nagel, who, as Jerry Devlin described him, was one of those poor souls in the glider. <laughs> this is Bob Ehrenberg, who, as Jerry Devlin described him, was one of those wild and crazy guys flying the glider. And he didn't have any words for the C-47 pilots, so you're on your own, <laughs> Bob Carr. So I'll walk them through a series of questions about their service. And then if we have a little time, we might get a, a, a little participation from other glider men or pilots in the audience. And then when we're all done, uh, Jerry, I'd like you to come back up here and we'll have questions and answers. I'm the fellow on the other end of the rope. <laughs> <laughs> I started out, uh, well, maybe I should initiate my talk by saying that I've been present in all the big wars. Not that I was in the war, but I was around, starting out about four months before, before the Great War. I was born about three blocks from Minnehaha Park, lived there until I was seven, moved, uh, became a farmer boy at the age of seven. Uh, Graduated from a small town high school, went to a small university because that's the only place I could get to. I happened to have an uncle on the faculty. I guess that covers most of, okay. briefly, most of my. Uh, well, just just quickly because this is this is background information. Yeah. Were you were you as a young man, 19, 20 years old, paying attention to events in Europe and Asia? Well, let's put it this way. My dad said there's going to be a war. He was born in Nottingham. Uh, I made the decision as a, as a uh, sophomore, or uh, yes, I, I a sophomore in college. Will I go on and take advanced ROTC, or will I not? I decided if I had bars on my shoulders, it was better than having them on, on my sleeves. I took advanced ROTC. Uh, I was, I was, I did that because I knew of what was going on in Germany and uh, Europe in general, and kept track of where the president was spending our money. I was born like this, like that. No, no, you got it. Just don't hold it too it's close. It's on. Okay, uh, Benson, Minnesota, and uh, my. Uh, I worked with my father, he was in the beer distributing business and Pepsi-Cola business at that time until then I was out ice fishing when we heard on the radio about Pearl Harbor. I didn't even know there was a Pearl Harbor at that time. But uh, shortly after that, then, uh, we went home and enlisted in the service. 
uh, where did you grow up and, uh, and uh, how aware of world events were you before Pearl Harbor? Uh, South Minneapolis, 27th, or uh, 2317th, 11th Avenue South. Uh, my dad was in the service and he said, uh, don't get in the Army. <laughs> he said, uh, he was telling me about all the trenches and the rats and all that stuff, so I didn't care to go. And, uh, but I was drafted. Well, I guess that's all you want, right? Okay, let's go back to, uh, to uh, Mr. Carr. Um, how and when did you enter the military? Well, I was automatically in the military when I graduated from college. I, had a, I was the shave tail in the reserve. Mm -hmm. And what year was that? 1940. And what was I doing? I hunted for a job for about six months and finally landed one with 3M Company. Uh, when I had in an hour, well, not an hour, a year plus a few days, uh, my orders ordered me to report to Camp Joseph T. Robinson, Arkansas. That was just long enough to guarantee me a job when I came back. Where was I on uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor? Well, my girlfriend invited me over for dinner and we heard it on the radio. Pearl Harbor has been attacked. My thought was, uh-oh, I'm going to be getting some mail pretty soon. You heard about Pearl Harbor, you heard about the attack, and what did you think about that? Uh, well, we knew we were going to. We knew we were going to be in the service, and I always enjoyed flying, and things not that I did much of it then, but the opportunity came with the CPT, uh, civilian pilots training, and they had it in the school and the college at Morris, Minnesota. I went through that, and we ended up with about a private pilot's license, but we were, and we were enlisted in the Air Corps when we were there doing this, and when that was one of the things we could have been in was glider pilot, or AT, or other, Air Transport Command, a lot of different pilots that are needed. And uh, they called us in, let's see, this is July, Around October, we were <clears throat> done with that training, and they called us into uh, glider training and uh, went to Roswell, New Mexico uh, for basic training in Plainview, Texas, for a dead stick school where we'd land. Uh, I shut off the, the engine when we saw our landing zone, and we uh, you just light in and with a dead engine. That's why they called it a dead stick school. And uh, that was done during the day and also at night. You'd fly out at night about three miles and there'd be a smoke pot. You'd take a left turn and you'd fly and you see another smoke pot and you take another left, go back to the strip and you're downward. And I'd, if they give you a green light, then you know the strip was open. You shut off the engine and land. It was, and then you can do it again and again and again. I keep doing this for about six weeks. <laughs> and you get so you can do it pretty well. I think that's did, you, did you have a specific choice about being a glider pilot? Not at that time. No, not at that time. There was no choice. They could call you for anything that they needed pilots at. And, and I wasn't put out about it at all. It, you do what you're going to do. And so that was uh, what happened there. <laughs> My commission was in the infantry. At Camp Joseph T. Robinson, it was a base where the, all of the draftees reported, and my particular battalion was training draftees to be in the medical corps, whether they were litter bearers or whatever their job. I had to teach them to march, to pitch tents, and to read maps. After six, uh, you want me to go on to the next one? Yeah, that's fine. After about uh, six or more, six to eight week training sessions, I decided, uh, and having incidentally on weekends gotten my own private license to fly, I applied for flight training in grade. And uh, 
luckily, as far as I was concerned, I was accepted and got to learn to fly as a, second, as a first lieutenant. Did you have a choice about the type of aircraft you were going to fly? Uh, no, I didn't know that until advanced training. You're aware that there's basic, primary, basic, and advanced. And uh, I was flying two engine planes at that point. That didn't tell me anything in particular. But after a month of that, proc no, a little longer than that, uh, I was assigned to transition training in C-47s. So guess what? Okay. How did you feel about flying C-47s? Oh, I wonder what they're like. Okay. I found out they're uh, undoubtedly the best plane the Air Force ever had. Okay. Your father, the World War I veteran, had warned you about, world, about the service. And, uh, and you, can you describe how you entered the military? Yeah, I, I was drafted. Uh, President Roosevelt sent me a nice little card, greetings, you're, you're wanted in the Army. So I went out to Fort, Fort Snelling, and uh, I had physical, cut my clothes, and, and uh, then they said, you got a 10-day leave, and come back in 10 days. So I came back in 10 days, and they uh, had a bunch of us ready to go to, they said, you're going to Fort Bragg. Uh, so we got we had railroad tickets, and the railroad train was right there. So we just got on and went to Fort Bragg. And no, no asking me questions or do you choose going here? Or, they never asked me anything. <laughs> never. They just told me get in the back of the truck or <laughs> you know, somebody would say, where, "Where are we?" And I said, "I don't know. We we were driving backwards, looking out the back of the truck." So in your case, being a gliderman wasn't part of the all-volunteer force? No, we didn't no. volunteer. Okay. People always ask me, why did you volunteer? And I, I was sent right down there in, in the artillery. They didn't give me a choice of infantry or artillery, but I was glad to have gotten the artillery. Okay. Uh, to what unit were you initially assigned? Uh, 101st Airborne, 321st Glider Field Artillery. And did, what were your feelings about when you found out you were going to be in a glider unit? What did you think about that? Well, I, I didn't know. I, I'd never been in the air before. So it, it was the first time I went out, we took out in the, off the runway. Oh, wait a minute. Before you get up in the air, oh. talk about your ground training. Your ground training as a glider. Well, what, ground did they, what did they teach you? They gave us a, a parachute and instructions how to use it. And uh, then... Uh, we had, we had tie downs. We had an uh, artillery piece in there, and we had to turn, learn on the knots to tie it down. And uh, uh, that was about all the training we had. No specific training for landing in water or anything like that. Landing we, landing procedures, anything like we that. We had no rest uh, <laughs> that you could pull out oxygen or. Oxygen, I guess it was there. But, uh, and it's, they, uh, I don't know, they never told us, we never jumped out the plane, out of the glider. But we had all that stuff with us. So, can you describe your first glider flight? Yeah, we took off and the uh, couple of them start vomiting right away. <laughs> so, one. One fellow, he took his lining rod of his helmet and used it for a pot. And, and then we had uh, cherry nectar that day for lunch. This was one o'clock, and it come out red, and half the troops got sick. <laughs> I never did get sick in the glider. And after you'd flown, what did you think about the risks involved in being a gliderman? I liked it after a while. It was kind of fun for me, except a few times landing and going over the channel. And uh, as a gliderman, did you, did you and the other glidermen think of yourselves as part of an elite force? Oh, yes. <laughs> the only time we fought was behind the lines. And, you know, if we weren't behind the lines, they would circled us and, and, and uh, 
passed on, and that was, was December 7th, colder than Nick. But then, then we got three times the pay that a regular soldier got. It, was, it, it wasn't, uh, somebody said we got $30 a month, we got 50. <laughs> plus, plus, our, plus our 30. So it was 80 bucks in the, in poor British, we're only getting about 15. <laughs> so you, you were part of the, the uh, what is it, overpaid, oversexed, and over here generation. Is that right? <laughs> not me, but some. Oh, not you, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, what were your relations as glider men with the paratroopers of the 101st? We fought with them every day, uh, practice, uh, and put, I was artillery, we'd shoot shells over their head. And we never, never shot one short, even in combat, and uh, we got along good, but uh, I never went to the PX. I didn't care for beer that much, one bottle or so, but yeah, I didn't go there very often, but they got in arguments with, with each other, the, uh, troop, the paratroopers and the glider men. But, uh, Nobody ever got killed. Can you describe the experience of towing a glider? I will introduce that. Uh, when I got my wings, <clears throat> I was assigned to the 303rd Squadron, the 442nd Troop Carrier Group. This was 1st of December at Alliance, Nebraska. Are you familiar with the area? We flew from 7 in the morning until 2 in the morning at 20 below zero. During that time, we had an opportunity to uh, uh, experience flying a glider. Uh, <clears throat> I was very efficient. I had two rides in my first one. As, we, as, as the tow, po, a tow plane tightened the rope ahead of us, he poured the coal to it, and it had to be coal because of the black smoke coming out of the exhaust. There was a, a hill directly at the end of the runway, and that's about the time we got off the ground. <laughs> Immediately thereafter, the other end of the tow rope came back to us. Fortunately, I had a glider pilot beside me. He pushed the nose down and pulled it, pulled it back up again after he got a little speed. We dragged the tail over a hill and came down without any problems. That was my first and my last experience in a glider. <laughs> well, what about the experience of towing one as a pilot? <sighs> That's difficult to say. We started towing them uh, in our transition training. In January, we went to Pope Field, which you know is not too far from Fort Bragg. Towed gliders. Uh, you mentioned towing two. We actually towed three at a time to a very limited extent. If you're comfortable flying at 110 miles an hour, that isn't bad. We weren't. We never did that again. But uh, we did take up, I don't know whether it was a battalion or what, of, uh, of a, no, not, not paratroops, glider, we took up uh, paratroops. I don't think we towed gliders with any great experience there, but we did take paratroops. They were told to wear a lot, uh, what do you call it? Are you taking the in the water? May West. Oh, May West. May West, yeah. Not all of them did, and some of them drowned. We weren't so accurate on that uh, particular trip, but that was that was where we got most of our glider towing practice before we got to England. Can you describe the experience of being towed, and the experience of releasing yourself from the C-47? Maybe start at takeoff. Well, yes, you're <clears throat> you're on the side of the runway, and the tow plane, of course, has the center of it. This is at Lubbock, Texas, when they first started with the CG4A gliders, and uh, the one rope would be longer and one shorter if he's taking off two people, two gliders at a time, uh, <clears throat> and uh, 
when you were first off the ground, the tow plane was still on its wheels, you'd get up at like 35, 40 miles an hour, you were flying, and then you leave the ground, of course, take you up uh, and around the training circle, and bring you back by the downwind leg, you'd look out where your landing zone, where you think you could make it, uh, and you'd cut loose. There's a release in the center there, and it would drop the, the rope, and the tow plane would, I think they went around and got rid of the rope and, and landed again, of course. But then you would make your downwind leg and your crosswind leg, and then in, into your landing leg, and you had spoilers on the glider. If you come in a little high, it's okay. You could pull that and it would take away some of the lift of your wings. And also you could slip them very good. Uh, and uh, so if you're going to hit the spot, you got to slip and use your your uh, spoilers on the wing. And uh, you do that over and over again, as long as you, you can see in, in good training landing there, there's no problem at all. Although one time in, in Lomberg Maxton, that was, uh, they, they had a landing deal set up there. It was like uh, a couple of football fields. <coughs> and uh, they put some pine trees in pipes, you know, so that you had to go over those and then bring it down and stop. No, just hold it down just a little right. bit. Just farther away from your mouth a little bit, like that. That's perfect. Okay. Uh, they, they had to, uh, you know, to stay in your perimeters to stop before the end of that uh, 100 yards or so it was. Uh, and uh, it, it, was, it was no problem to do it after a while. Sometimes if you came in too fast, you could go on past that barrier. It wouldn't hurt anything. Uh, one time I, I smashed one up. But I came over the pine tree barrier at a, as slow as I could, you know, but just I could still feel I wasn't in a stall danger. And then the wind must have shifted or something when I got over the pine trees. I came down like that and the wings and the glider both tips hit the ground and broke the struts. Uh, my parachute went through the plastic seat in the glider and I got up and shut myself off. It's all dusty there and walked away from it, and I guess that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> it was a good landing, he said, and it was about as short of one he's ever seen. <laughs> and and uh, I guess that's, well, after, other than that, I don't know. After your crack up, was it, did it give you second thoughts? Was it harder to get in the glider the next no, day? No, I didn't bother at all. I, had, uh, I knew what happened. After Normandy and the few succeeding weeks in <clears throat> which we dropped supplies and, and landed in France, uh, on my birthday on the 17th of July, we headed for Italy. We ended up in a, an alfalfa field about 150 miles north of Rome. And our job there was to take, the, uh, to take care of the jobs that the uh, troop carriers in Italy had been doing while they were training for the uh, southern France invasion. Actually, uh, compared with other trips, uh, that was just almost like uh, delivering a, a load of K rations to another airfield. Uh, we flew across southern France. It was a bright sunny afternoon. The only uh, incident that I heard of and I didn't experience, one of the gliders had radio connection with the, with the uh, tow plane and said, pull up please, they're shooting at us with rifles. That was uh, my experience in southern France. Okay, now your second combat glider mission was into Holland and that was a very different operation. So can you please describe the mission and the conduct of the operation? Yes, well, uh, just briefly, our first, uh, we went in on the first day and dropped paratroops. We went in at 500 feet and came out at 1,500. Going in, there was one of the planes coming out and his right wing was burning, so fortunately, uh, he got down before we did. Uh, 
we came out fine on that trip. On the fifth day going into Holland, uh, we were assigned to go to, I think it was Eindhoven, and turn left and go uh, up and help the British uh, in their fighting there. Uh, as we left England, uh, it was very, very foggy. We could see all right, but not too well. As we got over the channel, uh, in order to be able to see what we were doing, we were almost uh, splashing water on anything behind us. The gliders, pilots, I have to commend because they were flying on the angle of the rope from the tow plane that was towing them. If it was up there, they were too low, and if it was like this, they were too high. Just as we hit the coast of France, clear weather, and we had to pull up, uh, I suppose, uh, 50 to 100 feet to, to uh, clear a chapel steeple. Uh, I had been flying with one fellow much of the time, and this time we made an, a, a mistake, a terrible mistake. Uh, those of you who've been in the service know that it ends with don't volunteer. Well, we volunteered, so each of us flew co-pilot for, for another pilot. And uh, if you're, many of you are probably aware of the formation we had was the lead plane and just behind and to the right uh, for four planes flying in the first row. My buddy was in the first plane and I was in the fourth. Uh, he got shot down. <coughs> I saw him, let's see, this was in September, I saw him in April. Uh, I don't know what happened to the other planes, but uh, I went on my way as we had been going, but uh, I changed the orders to return on the return flight. I didn't like the trip going in where they told us to go. Uh, we went down to about 50 feet over the Zyder Z, back into the fog of England and followed the railroad tracks. And that was another uh, contradiction of our training. We were told never to follow railroad tracks because you might run into a Navy pilot. <laughs> So you want to talk about the experience of, uh, of riding your trip into Holland in a glider and your landing. Taking off and take, take off, take off, the ride to Holland, and then your landing. Well, the paratroopers left at, uh, during the midnight, some of them, the, uh, December 17th, uh, September 17th. Uh, we took off, we were supposed to take off at 7.30 in the morning and back them up uh, with artillery. On the second day. Yeah, sec second morning, yeah. They uh, were over there with no support, so it, we had to go. We ate breakfast, ready to go at 7.30. The plane pulled up and tightened the tow rope up 300 foot. We couldn't see the plane on the ground. It was so foggy. This was about four days before he went, and he had the same problem. So they at 11, 11, 10.30, they said, we're going to have a sandwich, we're going to go anyhow, because they'll get slaughtered. We did that. They tightened up the tow rope, revved it up, it took off, and we followed the tow rope down for about half an hour. We, it, it was supposed to go at 60 in the flight, and we couldn't see the plane pulling us. I don't know where the rest of them were. So we took off after about an hour, half an hour, when they thought all of them were up there. We got to the channel, and there was a little opening, just a flash, we saw water. And we knew that that was leaving England. So about an hour later, we were flying along in the clouds. Couldn't still see the plane for two hours. The plane was running into a glider in front of him. So then he puts his flaps down and slowed down. No radio contact. So we're flying above the prop blast, up in the air, above the plane. So by the time he slowed down, we're passing him up. <laughs> He's down there behind us. And the rope is way back. No, keep the mic down just a little bit. Just a little bit down. No, like that. That's good. Oh, okay. 
Uh, so then our, our pilot revved up the engines and he just got the plane out with the big tail fin or the rudder, whatever you call it, was under our glider, but it didn't touch. And so we, we got, he got out of it. We're supposed to be going northeast with 60 gliders. He decided to go a little bit more east. We were at the right flank on, it, on those four angles like they have in formation. So he pulled out and, and we we're going along and all of a sudden we came out in France. It was a bright sunny day, not a cloud in the sky except for behind us. And then we got going. He raised, speeded the engine up. And caught, we caught up to the rest of them. And then we just caught up to them and then we were running into ACAC. So we're flying about 1,000 feet high. And then he goes down, way down. And I was watching the, the plane. The, there was a plane on our next, uh, next to us. His propeller hit the tree limbs, uh, leaves, took some of the limbs off. And we're flying a little higher. And then they were shooting at us. And you could see down there the Germans were shooting at us. And you know, they went right through our wing. and. It was just cloth, and it just tore it back. It didn't hurt anything. It didn't explode in the, in the, on the wing. It just went between the, the uh, supports, and I suppose. Then we got we got into uh, uh, our drop zone, a potato field, and uh, we, there was I don't know if there was sixty gliders, but anyhow, we all start cut loose at the same time, and we was cutting loose, and we knew we were going to land right by the woods here, and all of a sudden, here comes somebody turning and one, it was over the woods, we wanted to get in the field, and we missed them. And it was, then it was just about to land, and we, we knew we couldn't make it over this, there was a ditch, water ditches on each side of the road, irrigation, and we would have flipped over before they hit that. So there was another glider landing right, in, so we put our wing on top of his, and, and then we skidded right up to the ditch. And we made a good landing that was Perfect. I mean, for nobody got hurt. So then we was going to had a map, and we showed showed the the kid who was going to ask him where our drop zone here, and he was 14 years old, and he said in English, "Go right down the road, and you'll hit sand." And that that's that was our mission to get the bridge, but we were four hours late. They blew the bridge, and so then it was to keep Hell's Highway open. Hey Ray, would would. You describe landing in a potato field, and there's 60 gliders all trying to get in the field at the same time. Mm -hmm. Would you consider the landing to be the most dangerous part? Yeah. <laughs> one, glide, one glider landed on top. He was coming in, and it was all trees, and he was too low. So he, 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 he just uh, put his flaps down and pull a parachute back there to slow him down. And he landed right on top of the trees, and it didn't break the wings off. And then they just slid down the rope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they didn't have a Jeep or a 75 no. howitzer? No. Okay. Can you, can you describe your load? What was in your glider? Our glider was a 75 howitzer, and I, I think about 1,500 pounds. Mm -hmm. That was a little, a little mountain howitzer, right? A three-inch diameter yeah. in a shell about that long. And uh, we had smoke shells, tank shells, and but uh, uh, we 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 got good. Uh, we got. We, that, I think we were, the whole division was good. We fought together, and and we always. No nobody was arguing out in the field. We had a good outfit, 101st. Okay, now another glider had the jeep, and was there difficulties organizing on the ground and getting the gun and the jeep together? Yeah, that was our problem. We we pulled the jeep out by hand. We had to lift that front end up to about four of us or five. It was pretty heavy, and then. To, we had to pull the jeep out and tie it. Just it, the tie knots we had would just pull like a shoestring and, and it would come loose. Right now, I forgot the nut, even a knot. But and uh, we pulled the glider out, or the 75 howitzer out, and then the jeep. Uh, he'd come around looking around. You know, it was a big potato field. It had to be for 60 gliders, and uh, they had taken the potatoes out a week before, so it was all chopped up, uh, soft ground. The wheels broke off, and then it goes on its skids, on the skis, four skis underneath. And you turn the glider up and plow, You're, those skis are digging in, and the front of the glider is all round, and it's, it's wedges, and you stop in a hurry. 
you got to be buckled in, otherwise it'd flow you right, throw you right through the windshield or the front. Following our trip into Holland on that fifth day, I suppose it was weeks, maybe months later, we found out that after we got well on our trip, they called off the mission. Your third combat glider assault delivery was across the Rhine in March of 1945. This was the biggest airborne operation in history. And I think that the, uh, the flight of aircraft was, uh, what was, uh, was 100 miles long. And can you talk about that operation? Well, you give me, you give me information I had not heard before. Uh, the thrilling part as far as I was concerned is I was not assigned as pilot that day. I was assigned as co-pilot to the squadron CO. And as I recall the day, it was very similar to our southern France trip. Uh, we had a place to go to uh, take our uh, gliders, and we took them. And uh, were that gliders or paratroops I carried? I don't remember. However, we took them across the Rhine and dumped them in Germany and came home again. Those are nice missions. Okay. You were in the Pacific as part of the 5th Air Force. And can you describe the type of operations that you flew in the Pacific? Let's maybe just uh, talk about a couple of specific ones. You had an interesting one talking about Shangri-La. Well, that, our main thing, uh, we came in to Port Moresby moving our 433rd uh, troop carrier group material <clears throat> forward when we were to invade Japan. And as we went, <clears throat> the island of New Guinea is, is quite a large island. I, uh, it's well over a thousand miles up to the north, west end of it, went Biak. Like that. Just hold in it down. in uh, the island of Biak is where we were grouped at that time, bringing things up. Uh, and we didn't make or I, I did and a couple other fellows flew all the way back to Leigh, McGinney and picked up some gliders and flew them on up to Hollandia, which is about a thousand miles. And then from there, the next day, we took them into our BIAC area and used them for training there for working our way on up. And when we left Leigh, New Guinea, I was talking about it a while ago here, these clouds and the glider doesn't have any instruments for going through clouds uh, and there's some little clouds we had to come up through and get on top of and uh, so they we have no we couldn't talk to our buddies that were flying the C-47 so they just pull you right through the clouds anyway and you just hope that that rope was going where you were going and you kind of followed that so you wouldn't be coming out of there upside down or something like that. And, uh, and then when we got above the clouds, it was just fine. But they were, they were a lot of work flying those because we had to hardly keep them in trim and keep it away from the other glider. And, and it gets rough weather. Maybe you'd want to be in below the prop wash or you could fly up through the prop wash. You could feel the, the whole thing shake and you get on top of the prop wash. It might be easier flying up there. Well, it took almost a day to, to get there anyway to Hollandia and, and then uh, the next day to a uh, little island of Aoi. Most of this is island stuff and over water. We followed the coastline, <clears throat> north coastline of New Guinea all the way uh, past the Pacific River. And uh, it, yeah, I was afraid I'd, I'd rather land in water than I would in. Uh, in the jungle there, they had kuna grass that was 12 feet high and full of rocks underneath it. Uh, so it looked pretty level, but they, they said don't ever try it too, <laughs> unless you have to, of course. But just some other things there. I, from there on, we went to the Philippines and Clark oh, Field. And you, you had a, in Biak, you had a, a rescue mission that you were almost... Oh, uh, yeah, out of Biak, that. that was the time uh, they called it. There's a book about it. They call it uh, the Shangri-La thing. <clears throat> there was the mountain ranges in New Guinea on both coastlines, and in the center, it's it's regular just valleys and 
and planes and such. And this C-47 had a crash landing in there, and the pilots and co-pilot and an army nurse, they were all okay. Uh, but their, the plane was wiped out, and the deal with these mountains, I think they were three, four, five thousand foot mountains. Uh, to go over there and then land and uh, and then set up one of these pickup deals for a C-47 to come in with a tail hook on it and put everybody in that glider and bring them back out of there. Well, we were issued all the gear to go in and do that. Me and a, another fellow called Canella, um, he was from Wisconsin. And, and we didn't know what to expect in there. They told us they didn't know what was in there either, the natives with their spears and whatnot. We didn't know what we'd run into, but they called the whole doggone thing off and went in with some paratroopers and uh, L5 and uh, ferried them out of there that way. And uh, that's uh, after that episode, as we went on our way up towards the Philippines and towards Japan, because that's what our Big story was going to be in Japan invading the southern islands in time. It never came off because of the atomic bomb. And did you have a specific mission that you were preparing for into Japan, or was it too early to tell you? Well, all this was in keeping in shape and flying skills in order to, to do that. And then a funny story about <clears throat> when I was in the Philippines, August 10th is my birthday. and. I was in the officer's club with a bunch of friends, and I'd buy a few drinks there. They weren't too expensive. And uh, then the anti-aircraft started going off all around Clarkfield, and uh, and small arms fire and stuff. Gosh, you know, we thought, well, here is my birthday, and they're starting a war all over again in here. So we thought it was pretty secure there, and, and it was, but we find out the next day that it was... Uh, a rumor had come down that the bomb had been dropped in Hiroshima. Uh, you know, I think it was on the 7th of August, wasn't it, or something? And my birthday was on the 10th, anyway. We finally heard something about it then. And uh, from then on, it was all to go to Japan. Uh, every plane and every troop carry group we had was loading up personnel and airborne and everybody and hauling them into Japan before they changed their mind or something, I suppose. So we took over the Tachikawa Airdrome out of Tokyo then and stayed there for about three months, uh, uh, breaking up our outfit and uh, going home after that. Mm -hmm. When did you get home? Uh, I got home for Christmas in 45. Mm -hmm. uh, then. And, and you met with, uh, oh. you, you, what? Go ahead. Yeah, you know, there was another thing in, in Tokyo. We still flew our liaison planes and then uh, we would go with the C-47 pilots and uh, put in some flight time with them so we could get our flight pay. We fly around Mount Fuji. If I may, I wondered uh, what was behind the uh, decision in our group, or our squadron anyway. Uh, the glider pilots weren't doing anything, and we thought they just wanted to make it easier for everybody. Apparently they needed flight, uh, flight time too. So, uh, the navigator of our squadron gave them a brief map reading course and they became uh, co-pilots. Uh, as far as I personally am concerned, that worked fine because we were flying around quite a bit, uh, picking up GIs and taking them through the Riviera for R&R &R and bringing others back and so forth. So I was flying east, generally, and I looked down out of my window and uh, I said, where are we? He looked at me with kind of a blank expression and I looked at the map and it appeared that we were over Prague, which was Russian territory. It was on a flight uh, of that kind. We may have been carrying troops. We may have been carrying uh, VIPs or something like that. But uh, I think uh, as to where we were when the war ended, we were probably flying because quite often we listened to BBC. 
And that, I suppose, is where we got the news that the German war was over. What was the date of the end of the Japanese war? Uh, August 15th. August 15th. Well, uh, that's when I was maneuvering to come home. Uh, I had taken, I think, a two or three week leave to London. Uh, we were based in nor northeastern France at the time. And when I returned, I found out that I had become a captain, number one. Number two, I found out that I was going home. The orders told us to report to England. It didn't say how we were to get there, except they suggested a port of France where we could get transportation across. That was fine, but we were 20 flight officers and uh, the CEO of that particular port didn't care whether we got to England or not. So uh, we went sightseeing for a day or two and found a ship that was going out the next morning. And uh, we got our e equipment and got onto that ship and uh, didn't ask anybody. And we landed in England the next day. We spent probably three weeks there before we got on a I've forgotten the class of the ship now, but it was one of the faster ships, passenger ships, going back to America. It took us five days to get back. And I ended up in the Camp McCoy in Wisconsin. That's where I was deprived of my infantry commission and uh, replaced it with an Air Force commission. And from there I went home, home to Minnesota. Did you ever fly again after the war? Well, uh, the answer, answer is essentially no, but uh, when I got, uh, when I was, well actually I was still on duty. I came home in October and I was still on duty till the end of December. But uh, as far as licensing was concerned, I could fly any four engine plane that was available at the time but I was not licensed to fly a Piper Cub. <laughs> so I, uh, I remedied that by using the GI Bill and getting trained as an, as an instructor in a, in, in a one, single engine plane. And I got that certificate and beyond that, at $150 a month, I wasn't doing much flying. And I'm sorry to say that uh, while I was in the reserve for a while, they took us out and we found that we were going to be flying in AT-6s, which uh, if you're not aware of them, when you're on the ground, you don't see anything except the wings on the right or the wing on the left. If you're gonna run into something, you know it only after you've hit it. Uh, further, they were gonna give me two hours flight time a month. And when I got a letter saying, did I want to return to active duty? Did I want to go into continuing flight reserve or did I want to retire? Guess what I did? I retired. Okay. It was kind of chilly in the bulge, but around zero. For 31 days, we stay out, stayed out all the time. And I was talking to a friend just last year and he said, I said, we never had anybody caught a cold in, Bat in Bastogne. He said, I had pneumonia when I was a kid twice, and I never had it over there. Nobody had pneumonia, nobody had a cold, but uh, we froze our feet and hands, a lot of them did, and they happened to catch our rear echelon coming into supplies when we when it went in, then they encircled us, and they caught our doctor doctors in uh, a lot of our supplies, and uh, so with the frozen feet, they had to just give them whiskey, hold them down, saw the feet off. Okay, so let's get you home. Yeah, I'm, then we went down, fighting along France, in France there, ended up uh, going heading for uh, purchase, uh, um, Salzburg, Austria. And uh, uh, then the, the uh, war ended after we got there about two days, we were, told the Burgermeister to get us a hotel, the, one of the officers. We got a hotel for the whole battalion. 
nice hotel. First time we've been in a building since we left England. And uh, we never went in in buildings in France or, or in their houses. But anyhow, then uh, the war ended two days later. And they said, anybody want to go to Hitler's hide hideout before we leave? And so we went down there, and I got a big box of linen, silverware, and, and some uh, five uh, German teapots, metal teapots, individual. Then uh, uh, they come around the next day and said, Nagel, we drew your name for 30 days R and R at home. <laughs> So the war was just ended. So he said, you've never come back because the war's gone. You go to Japan with some other outfit. I said, I'll take the pass. And so we went to Sherberg. And on the way to Sherberg, we had six trucks out of our division. They're going back home. In the mountain, there was a, tree, a, a civilian truck come around the mountain, hit one of our trucks, and it went down the mountainside. Everybody was killed. And so we had five trucks left. So we went to Sherberg. And, Got a ship there and, and went to uh, New York, Statue of Liberty, and uh, they give us a big farewell greeting at, at the visitors, whatever, in New York there. And uh, then they took us off there and put us in train that went to Minneapolis. We got to Minneapolis, nobody had agreed us, five of us. So there was one man there, a photographer from the Star Tribune, and uh, he took our picture and put it in the paper the next day with our names on the bottom. And I don't know how we got home from, from Fort Snelling. We must have, uh, maybe to give us a ride in the truck downtown or something, or maybe we got a, found a streetcar and got on, and that's how I got home. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Now, I'd like, I know there's other glider veterans in the audience, so I'd like you to stand up, please, if you are a, either a gliderman or a pilot. No, I'll do it. Okay, please, and stay standing, please. You just, uh, now, now is the part of the program where I lose control. So, if you can, just say your name and your unit, and you can tell one quick glider story, okay? My name is Lester Swarm. <clears throat> I'm from Wausau, Wisconsin. I was in the 325th and 326 Glider Infantry went into Holland at Market Garden. It was my first combat. And as we were going into <coughs> to Holland, it was rather an uneventful flight. But as soon as we hit the German lines, they threw everything but the kitchen sink at us. And if you remember, our glider pilot, we had one pilot and our co-pilot was the top-ranking officer in our group. He had five minutes of instructions before taking off. As we hit the, the German lines, many, uh, two, I was one of the few that went up around the pilot and stood around the pilot because if he was killed, we all would have been. Thank you. So, so you were getting ready to take over the controls, you mean? No. Oh. Just to, if any... You were a buffer. You were his bulletproof vest. Yeah, oh. there you go. Did he ever thank you? Yes, he did. Oh, good for him. <laughs> okay, just uh, say your name, your unit, and what you did. You can tell one, one quick story. They have to be quick. Tim Bailey from uh, First Air Commando. I'm, and uh, I told a story here last... Turn around. Time. You can turn around oh, for the audience. Sorry. I told a story here last year about uh, rescuing a family, a Burmese uh, officer's family from harm's way. So I won't tell that one, but uh, I wound up at Rangoon, uh, right north of Rangoon, and we saw the prisoners come out there. And uh, then I saw the last Jap Zero shot down that was, that was shot down in Burma. And I got his gun and uh, the holster, and uh, it's in a museum now, but Anyhow, it was quite a thrill. We chased the Jap from, the, from Mike Tila. I talked to some of the boys last year, and uh, they, we chased them clear down to Rangoon and uh, clear out of, out of uh, territory. I slept in a glider one night beside a big gun, and uh, I didn't sleep, but I, I was in a hammock, 
in the back, and uh, but I did see the prisoners come out, and the whole thing wind up, and it was an interesting story. It's, and we actually had to fly it four hours before they let you tow them. And uh, the Burma thing was uh, we'd land about half the time and drop about half the time, and and. When we were approaching Rangoon, the other gentleman was talking about it. As we approached Rangoon, well, they uh, came up with some new airplanes for us. We got uh, C-46s, and we wound up moving into China. And uh, that's about my story with the glider. OK. My name is Doug Flynn, and I was with the 312th Proof Carrier Squadron, 349th Group. And the most exciting thing that happened to me, I graduated from flying school in March 1943. A month later, I got married, and I've still, we just celebrated our 66th wedding anniversary. Now, I think there was somebody back here, maybe being shy. Okay, if you can, uh, again, say your name, your unit, and one story. Can you hear me, Aaron? It's okay? Hi, I'm Bud Guerin. I served with the 17th Airborne Division, World War II. I'm an 86-year-old World War II veteran. I'm a paraglider trooper. I qualified both in a glider and paratroops. I was stationed at Camp McCall, North Carolina, and we took my glider training. My commanding officer was General Bud Miley, and he was interested in having some glider pilot, uh, glider troops becoming paratroopers. So he started a uh, jump training at Camp Forest, Tennessee, and that's where I took my jump training. I'm a veteran of the Battle of the Bulge, Central Europe, and the Rhineland. I was in the operation that the uh, C-47 pilot flew us over the Rhine River, March 24th, 1945, and we landed in Wessel, Germany. That's about all I have to say. Thank you. What would, what would you rather do? Jump or land? He asked me, uh, would you rather go into combat by parachute or glider? I'll take the parachute any day. <laughs> okay, now, the danger of knowing me and telling me your stories before the program. Hal, stand up. Now, most of these guys were 18, 19, 20 years old. 20, okay, well, whatever, young guys. And if they hadn't been in the war, they would have been home here driving up and down Lake Street chasing girls or something, joyriding. Well, Hal was a paratrooper in the 13th Airborne Division, and he decided to go joyriding in a glider. So as a paratrooper, what was your experience joyriding in a glider? Well, it was fun while it lasted. <laughs> I was in, uh, I was at a... I was at an airfield in uh, northern France, uh, near Amiens. Uh, I, I'm a long, younger than the rest of you guys there. I'm uh, just 83 now, so I'm um, younger than they were. Uh, I went over, didn't go overseas until uh, 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 January, early February of 45, and then the war was over in May. Uh, I was assigned to 13th Airborne, and uh, the 13th Airborne primarily was uh, airborne reserve at the end of the war. We were just there just in case we were needed. So we were in, the, in an airfield in, at uh, Amiens in France. Um, somewhere during that time, this is the last few months of the war now, uh, they brought in some C, uh, C-47s and also a few gliders. And they were giving the pilots, uh, the glider pilots, uh, familiarization and in takeoffs and landings, and uh, and we were in, in a tent city, uh, barbed wire enclosed, right next to the airport, uh, when they were doing this. And I, 
I thought, geez, you know, that looks like fun. I wonder if we can get a ride in one of those things. So with a couple of other guys, we jumped the fence and ran over there and said, what's the chance of getting a ride? Sure, hop in, the more the merrier, you know. And so off we went. Uh, we just took off. The, the, again, these were just familiarization flights. So we just took off. Uh, the plane circled around, came back over the airport, cut us loose. They went down one base and then final, came in for landing back on the airport again. So a nice, easy ride. And uh, about, about six rides, about roughly probably about six trips uh, we made. And uh, then we decided, we got bored a little bit, and so we decided to head back to camp. And, uh, but I remember the last thing I, of, about that that I remember is uh, uh, as we walked back uh, to jump the fence, I said, you know, uh, between the glider and the chute with this fellow, we'll take the chute any day. <laughs> okay, now we've got some time for questions and answers. So, any questions from the audience? This is for Bob Ehrenberg. Did you ever use the deceleration parachute when you were landing? Uh, no, we, we never did have those. Just don't, yeah, just don't. No, I never flew in with that on it. Uh, but all we could do is uh, slow it down. If you had to stop on the ground, we'd just push the stick way forward and drag the nose and that would dig in and you could stop pretty quick that way, but it'd be a dusty job. And so uh, we only did that in cases of emergency. Yeah, so. where, you, where you have a situation where you want to put a whole bunch of troops on the ground someplace, it sounds as though parachuting is better. Are there, are there cases where one way is better than the other? Well. I mean, the, the point with, with the lighter operations a lot of times was to l deliver equipment. Nowadays, they parachute the heavy equipment in. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the gliders were doing what the helicopters do now. That, that the, the plan was that there'd be less dispersion with the gliders coming in. They could land in a more concentrated way. For Mr. Ehrenberg, were you aware of any um, gliders that were lost on New Guinea that were never found? No. Uh, <clears throat> there were probably some left there as we went on up. You know, the ones that we used to fly just to keep flight uh, so we could uh, keep with it, you know. I, I think they were just left there as we went up to the Philippines. Uh, I don't think they would, they were shipping the gliders all boxed and they were shipped in and assembled farther on up the line where they were going to go. I just happened to bring that one up from Lee, New Guinea because it was assembled there and, and they needed some for for flying experience up in that end of the island there. And, uh, but uh, from there it was to the Philippines and, and uh, well, it wasn't too much. That, that was pretty well secured too. Our outfit was just moving behind the infantry all the way and when there was a field there, unless they needed, and uh, they would call on us for uh, fighting behind the lines, which we never were called upon to do, to lower, bring people on the back side of uh, where the fighting was. I think, I think your question was about uh, how many air, you know, are aircraft still being found in New Guinea, and they are. They're still being found a lot of places. So, Who had control of disconnecting the tow line, the glider pilot or the tow plane? Uh, the tow plane could drop the rope and they could drop it, but I suppose if they got in real trouble and wanted to get ready, they could get ready. But it would be the glider pilot. They'd take him over the landing zone or drop zone, they called it, is where they'd have flares or anything like that. And, and it was up to him. It was up to him at that time to, there is a release button. You hit that and, and you lose your rope. And you figure you can make it where you're going then. They, they told us uh, at the plane uh, when they tried to tow two around England for three and a half hours before we went to Holland. We didn't know what was going on. But they towed them around, and they, there was no communication with that damn radio on the, you, after you got in the air. But they said the C 47 pilot said if we drop our wheels, 
no matter where you are, hit that button. Go down in anywhere, because the they're 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 going to crash otherwise themselves. So either one could release it. But they drop the glider off at the airport usually, and then they'd go around and come back and drop the rope off by themselves. To, uh, the glider's on the ground then. Question okay. for uh, Bob Ehrenberg. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, at one time, if I heard you right, that you were wearing a parachute while you were flying the glider. Uh, what was? Were you able to get out of the glider with a parachute in in the air? That that was the army regulation. You had to have a, and there was a seat pack, and we used them finally for a pillow to sit on. <laughs> and uh, that never had any. Uh, well, if a wing fell off, I might have tried to get out of one. But as long as I had my wings and anything to do, I would fly it on down. Yeah, they told us uh, in the States, uh, they gave us parachutes and two pilots. We got overseas, they said, you don't need two pilots to land that glider in England. They told us that. And so they took a pilot away, and then they told us, you get up there and, and uh, steer the pedals, uh, rudders, and... and uh, then they said, you don't need uh, uh, well, a, a parachute to land in a glider. So they took the parachutes away. <laughs> <laughs> so, and they told us, you, we, you, we're good, you're going to land at an airport. The paratroopers would jump in an airport, clean it out, and we'd come in and land at the, in the runway. But the, the runway is a potato field. <laughs> Never got saw a runway where you wouldn't. Uh, Ray, you mentioned a while ago that uh, the radio communication in the glider was terrible. You can't. Did, you could, did, couldn't talk to the pilot. Yeah, but do you do you remember actually being in a glider that had a radio in it and not an intercom system? No. Well, uh, yeah, they all hit it, but you 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 could talk on the ground, on, but but when you got in the air, you couldn't talk. Yeah. You couldn't even talk in, to. Next door, you had to scream. It was you so do, noisy in there. You do recall a radio and a glider, though. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, they all hit them. A radio or a telephone to the, to the pilot? A radio. Okay. Radio. radio. I've, uh, the ones that I flew, they had at one time uh, a wire running along the tow rope, but that tow rope, and that would, uh, it would like taped every so long and and the wire was supposed to stretch evenly so it wouldn't break, but but they hardly ever worked. They, uh, that's, that's all that, that I had communications with the tow plane. But then in the glider pickup situation, the glider, the, uh, the tow plane that picked up the, <coughs> the glider, it had like a big fishing reel in the center there. And <coughs> that was set so it would tighten up the cable after it, when, it, when it engaged with the glider, it would pay out to take up some of the shock. And, and then the, I, I suppose the flight engineer in the C-47 would reel in that, that cable on up, back up again, so you were, your normal length of uh, tow rope involved with that. <clears throat> One danger in, in doing that trick was anything coming loose and flying back at the glider, and it was like a rubber band. Even if it wasn't a metal piece on the end, uh, even the rope itself would smash in the whole front end of the glider, and it could be bad, yeah. Question for Mr. Linsmeyer, who manufactured the gliders. Which model of the, of the glider were you manufacturing? Whereabouts in Minneapolis did you manufacture it? Did you manufacture the whole plane or just parts of it? If you come to the symposium, you'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> We're from St. Paul. <laughs> uh, the uh, family business was started in 1882 making beer boxes. And uh, we evolved into uh, cabinet work, some mill work, and got involved with the, the wood parts. So we produced all the floors, all the wings, and the empennage. And uh, we started, we built 1,509 CG4s, A's, and we were one of two manufacturers of the CG-13A, of which there are, I think, a total of 90, and we built 47. And I don't know, that's a big plane, and uh, you saw from Jerry what it looked like, and 
I did send, have a picture of a CG4A and a CG13A at Old Chamberlain. I sent a copy on to the uh, people at the Air Force Museum, and they said, thank you very much. We never have a picture, we've never had a picture of those two together, so it's a pretty rare plane. But uh, yeah, we're, ha we're having fun with this uh, glider, and I hope any of you can come the next uh, tomorrow or uh, Saturday morning. And we're, um, there's a bunch of crazy people building it. I'm just, just along for the ride, so thank you. Oh, the, the plant was across from downtown St. Paul on the River Flats. Uh, you're spending, the, the time here has been on the glider pilots. My question would be a little different. I'm wondering how many of the people in the audience here have been members of uh, glider infantry regiments besides the one gentleman next to me? Well, we had the man back here that was, he, he was a paratrooper and a glider man. I'm not sure, he didn't say what regiment he was in, 17th Airborne Division. But I think, I think he and, and you, Ray, there was a, you're the only glider men here, I think, tonight, right? Was there another one? Oh, right there, I'm sorry. The, yeah, 82nd Airborne Division, sure, 325, yep, I'm sorry. Yep, so there's th three. Yeah. Jerry, as you were showing your what you call it, <laughs> the, <laughs> you, the, the glider men were wearing, um, were wearing um, leggings. And I wore leggings as I went over as a replacement. As soon as I hit Leicester, England, and assigned to the 325, they gave me a pair of jump boots. And that's at the same time when they gave us Gliderman that extra pay. It, it, it would have been right in the Normandy invasion time, is what I'm trying to say. If the ropes were not different lengths, if you discovered that, what would your options be? And which glider would release first, or would the tow plane release? Or what would you do in a situation of a double tow with the same length of rope? Well, I'm sure you could trim your glider out and, uh, and fly apart from one another. <clears throat> that wouldn't be hard to do at all, but they, they did make them short and longer just so you wouldn't have to fight that problem too much, I guess. Otherwise, you could have flown them with the same length of ropes. Uh, you know, uh, one other thing, if I doing. can, the, the, the British actually didn't have nylon ropes, they had hemp. Yeah, they had very hemp. wet right. and heavy. We have a question. Uh, did you have brakes on the gliders to use when you landed? And our training, our training gliders had brakes on them, and uh, they were used most of the time rather than dumping them on the nose because that was kind of a destructive way it would break something as a rule. They did that, so, but they did have brakes and wheels. I, all the ones that I flew in, anyway. Okay, well, that concludes our program. So if you'd like to talk to our veterans or Jerry Devlin, they'll be here for a few minutes. Thank you very much. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Katherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org. Production services provided by Barrows Productions.